If we're talking about performance engineering and IT today, then that means it must be the SMC Journal podcast. And yes, it is. I'm Scott Moore, your host. Thank you for joining me today. This is a rare opportunity that you have watching this show because we're going to be talking to somebody who works at a Fortune 50 company and wants to reveal to you how they're scaling their performance engineering and testing in an organization that is extremely large and they're just about to go through a huge acquisition that's going to make them even larger. How do you do something like that? I mean, I've worked at startups before and I've worked at smaller companies of consulting at all sizes. And I can tell you, the bigger the company gets, the more of a challenge it becomes to get a lot of people that can do performance testing and performance engineering well and also help the other teams do that. So what are the challenges at a large organization like that? I'm sure many of you who are in this profession would want to know. And that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do... Let's talk about the sponsors that make this show possible. This episode is sponsored by Microfocus and the LoadRunner Solutions family. That includes LoadRunner Professional, Enterprise, Cloud, and Developer. You know, performance matters. Did you know that LoadRunner Solutions have the largest community of practitioners in the world? Join that community at community.microfocus.com, scan the QR code, and check out the LoadRunner family page on performance engineering, as well as their YouTube playlist that we've got links for in the show notes on smcjournal.com, as well as YouTube. This episode is sponsored by PFLB, a provider of premier load and performance testing services for enterprises in all industries. They focus on a robust methodology, tools, and experienced engineers. Since 2008, they've built a reputation for reliability worldwide. BoomQ is their own innovative performance testing solution, and they consult around industry standard tools like JMeter, LoadRunner, Grafana, and more. Find out more at pflb.us. This podcast is sponsored by StormForge. The StormForge platform focuses on AI-powered software designed to help DevOps teams release with confidence and IT leaders realize the promise of cloud native. That means faster innovation, higher quality, resiliency, scalability, and efficiency. Find out more at stormforge.io. So I met Matthew Stevenson at a recent road show, show event for my performance tour uh, show. And then I found out after talking with him, very passionate person about performance, um, that he's actually heading a fairly significant team inside of Kroger. And just in recent weeks, uh, there has been an announcement that Kroger is actually buying Albertsons, another major retailer. So this is going to make them huge. And so I wanted to ask Matthew to be on the show because it would be great for those of us, or some of you have never worked in a company that large before. And so you're thinking, well, how hard can it be? I mean, when you do your testing, you do your tuning, you do, it's pretty, it, it's not so easy, especially when you've been around for so long. So I wanted to ask Matthew, what are some of the challenges that you face trying to scale this up in your organization? And what, what do you see um, as the biggest thing that we can improve on, on making it easier to do that? And I got a fresh perspective on that. So let's go to that interview with Matthew now. Hey, Matthew, how are you doing, sir? I'm pretty good, Scott. How are you? I'm fine. Welcome to the SMC Journal podcast. We're glad to have you on. Thank you, sir. I'm glad to be here. Um, why don't you introduce yourself to our audience, um, what you do and how you, you're doing performance engineering today. Excellent. So my name is Matthew Stevenson. I am the uh, senior manager for advanced performance engineering for Kroger. Um, I've been doing performance engineering, performance testing for almost 22 years now. I started off way back in the late 90s, late 90s um, and have been doing it ever since. I've worked for various Fortune 500 companies. I've been a consultant. And, and I found my way to, to Kroger about 18 months ago. And the, the purpose of, of coming to Kroger, or why Kroger brought me here, was to bring performance engineering to Kroger, to, to bring us from a um, checkbox QA type of testing organization to a real sense of performance engineering and, and mature the practices along the way. Uh, along, there, along with that is 
to, to engage every capability team, every area that we're at, and bring performance quality. So in the last 18 months, we have gone from, I think we were roughly about 18 people when I got here, and we had just been formed. So we were pretty much a reorg, brought everybody together. I got hired and brought in, and we're now sitting at 55 engineers. Wow. And we're going. The, the, the goal has been to engage everywhere that we can engage, test everything that we can test, and then along the way, improve our effectiveness and efficiency. So the mantra every single day when, when I wake up and my leaders wake up is how do we improve our effectiveness and how do we improve our efficiency? So team like ours, we run manually, just off the top of the head, we, we hit play and we watch the results. We run about 2,800 tests a year. Mm. manually. It means we're giving results, we're giving feedback, we're doing deep dive diagnostics. You factor in CICD, this year it'll be about 8,000 on top of that. Next year it'll be double to triple that as we're digging deeper into the CICD uh, implementation so that we can build tests and, and report back. Um, these numbers start to grow. So you know, my favorite joke is size matters. And in, in our case, size does matter. Size changes perspectives on everything. So we, we're focusing on testing. But what we're really doing is we're looking at extreme shift lefts and extreme shift rights. Testing is that middle ground. Testing, from, from my perspective and from my experiences, the code's already baked. The problems are already there. All you're doing at that point is uncovering them and, and talking through the risks and potential remediations. When we look at shift left, we're trying to address the problems before they even happen. Most of the problems we see in the middle in the testing come from that, that poor requirements up front. And then we try to string all this together and look at production. What is actually happening in production? What can we learn from production that, that is better, faster, um, more effective than just testing and then string it all together? So the first 18 months has been building that building that, that centerpiece of testing being effective and efficient, and then attack, tackling these other ends. So it's been very methodical since we, since we started or since I started. First was get the people together. The next one was start building our training up so that we continue to upskill our engineers. And now it's you know, go out and, and start returning the investment on testing, but now also looking at that data and going left. Very impressive, actually. And I, Kroger has got a special place in my heart because one of my first companies, consulting companies, was brought in. And we're talking 2005, 2008, 2009. We did some a lot of project work for them. But they were still, at that point, it was still like as, as it was needed. They did some performance testing, but it was for the, mostly for the bigger projects. And to see them making this shift, which they've done over the, the past few years. Uh, it's exciting. But and, and there's big news in the market just in the last few days, uh, as of this recording, that Kroger is actually acquiring Albertsons. So you're about to get even bigger mm -hmm. than you were before. Um, this is why I wanted to have you on, Matthew, because I want to talk a little bit about a sensitive topic these days. For companies as big as yours, that's different than a mid-market or a Bob's Meat Shack, or a, where we can we can start up a new company with 20 people and we go cloud native and we pull all this open source stuff. We put everything together. We've got a product and we're, we we're made from unicorn dust and all these things. But now you're, you're a company that's been around for so long and you're so big, you don't quite move at the same speed and at the same rate and the same space as some of these others. Uh, are you embracing DevOps? Are you embracing, uh, you know, continuous testing? Are you able to do that at this scale? And let me preface this question by saying I'm hearing in the market, look, that doesn't always work the same for us at our scale. You need to let us do what we do and get the results that we need to get. If it works for us, it doesn't mean that it's wrong if it's not what the cool kids are doing. Do you know where I'm coming with this? How does that play for Absolutely. Kroger? So, so we are we are moving in those in that direction. We have aspirations to be um, where we can build code, 
or write code, build code, deploy code all within the same hour, right? Get to that point where you hit, you hit build and it goes through the entire QA cycles, including performance and ends up in production. So we have that aspiration. We also do blue green deployments. We're also looking at testing and then taking advantage of, of what we can do in production to continue to bolster that. So, so that is all true and it's all, it's all stuff that we want to do. Um, there are places though, where you just can't do that. Right. So the, the, the trick is, is not have a one size fit all approach to, to any of this. And so our challenge or my challenge is managing a team the sizes is, is that I don't have a standard process right? because it's not one size fit all. I got some places where I do a, 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 um, a shared service type of engagement. Right. I have, I have other places in the organization where we're truly embedded. I got engineers on teams were, were visceral upfront working with code and teams and testing and, and that type of stuff. And, and then we have other teams that are doing the DevOps QA ops role where they're, they're working, you know, in between where development has cut some code loose and, uh, you know, that traditional DevOps and they're, they're taking that practice along. So the, the, the company, the size of Kroger is you end up with lots of all of that. And, and there are some very traditional agile. There's some that are kind of following agile waterfall, you know, kind of combo to product led journeys, right? We're, we're all of that at the exact same time. So with various velocities. So the challenge we have is keeping up with those velocities because we don't want to be that bottleneck. So as we deploy our testing technology, velocity matters. And so I want to be able to test as quickly as possible, as soon as possible, get the most relevant information into the right stakeholders' hands absolutely as quickly as possible. Well, do you find that your team is playing the role of like a mentor to some of these teams where you're helping them uh, not catch a fish or catch a fish instead of just feeding them fish? Are they taking some of that responsibility on their own or is your team actively involved in every aspect of, say, the performance testing? So as a practice, we're actively involved with, our, with everything. Do we want to partnership and mentor and teach, teach a team to fish? Absolutely. Our shift left strategy is, you know, we'll help you fish. The, the, the best representation of that is, is where you teach a team to fish and then you go fish with them and you're both working in the middle to improve your performance quality. That's the best expression. The challenge we have as leaders, not, not as engineers at, 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 or performance engineers at development, but as leaders is understanding is that the right use of all of our talent? Because do, do I really want to have my developer doing performance testing? Or do I want my developer fixing code and writing code? Does my developer have the right skill set? And so when you start looking at it from a that that practical side of it, there are times and places where shift left and having the development team do all the testing doesn't make sense. There are times when you want those subject matter experts to come in and do that with them, not for them, but with them. Right. Because, you know, that's, it's a skill. This isn't just, you know, I build automation, I hit play and I go away. That's, that's really testing at the lowest form. When we talk about expressing an engineer, um, a performance engineering practice or process, it's more than that. And, and those skills are harder and harder to come by as you continue to go up the, up the pyramid of competency. So that actually was leading me to the next question. You just uh, touched on it about skills. Do you find that one of your biggest challenges is finding people with the right basic level of skills to be a good performance engineer or are you, are you having to teach them from the ground up or uh, is, is, is that a big problem for you? Yes. It, and, it, it, and it's, I would say it's a natural problem. It's also a problem we've created as a practice. The, the, there is a skill set to being an engineer, performance engineer. If you, if you want to be a true performance engineer, in my opinion, you have to be able to embrace the underlying science behind how systems work, how computers work, how computers process, what are the characteristics that we're out there measuring? And if you don't have that fundamental understanding, it makes it very hard to sit down and look at uh, what design patterns are needed in order to solve a, a particular problem. So it's easy to test. It's harder to, to, to continue to go up that scale. And when you get down to the, fact, the, the point where you're understanding 
concepts like big O notation or queuing theory and things like that, and applying that to your day-to-day -day work, that starts limiting quite a few people. Um, and, and there's a, it, it's not that, that we don't have people that are able to learn that. It's just, it's just not an expectation. Mm. Most computer, most, most performance people can make a pretty good living just testing and reporting. So why would a, a person who's not necessarily um, driven or gifted for that, for, you know, for that skill set or knowledge, why would they want to put the effort into it if they don't really need to? And we find that. We find that in our industry, um, okay is good enough and you'll make an okay salary and, a, and, a, and there's not a huge need to progress. That starts weeding out people quickly. By the time we get to, I need a performance engineer or somebody to grow, we've probably gone through 100 to 200 people. Wow. Out of a large organization like mine, there's probably only four that will make it to the point where they can sit and go right, shift right, look at the data, look at the patterns, understand what those patterns mean, and make knowledge out of that pattern. That's not a lot. I mean, out of you know, almost 60 engineers, I'll have five. So are and you probably, saying that the secret sauce for those four people is that they're able to actually tell the story? It's more than just tell the story. I think telling the story is a critical piece in that journey. I don't think, I, I don't think you get to the pinnacle unless you can tell the story. And that's, that's been my biggest, um, I wouldn't say pet peeve, it's my biggest um, concern for our industry for almost 20 years. I got a couple of the best, my best job jobs I ever had because I could tell the story. Being able to sit down to a room full of stakeholders, take two or three slides and say, here's what your quality looks like. That's a, that's a talent. Mm -hmm. I've seen, I have met people in our industry that dwarf me in programming skills, dwarf me in the ability to take a tool like Load Runner or Nilo and do something with it. But they can't tell the story. Yeah, I, and, and and I agree. I, th I think that's the biggest part of it, and that's kind of what um, what I'm always talking about in the performance store is you become more valuable to a company when you can t tell a story in addition to some of these these other engineering skill sets that you need. But it brings me back to this other question, which is if we we kind of all recognize that we're missing something in these skill sets that performance engineers don't really go to school to get this. They usually learn it from hard knocks or they were in a developer role or another role. Maybe they were in operations and they, they learned the infrastructure side of it or then that maybe they just didn't like developing or whatever, but they found this, this thing that they liked and they, they learned that tuning applications and making them perform better and making them more efficient was a cool thing to do. But what can we do? Like you're you're running into issues where it's hard for you to find people to scale up even bigger than you are today. And 55 people, I mean, just to have 55 decent performance tester engineers is very hard to do these days. Mm -hmm. But what can we do as a whole to make this better or easier to get people, I don't know, involved or learning these skill sets? Where do you think that starts? Starts with us as leaders. All right. So, so in, in my case, at it, it, it Kroger, it's my problem. It's, it's, if, if we have a deficiency, it's my fault. It's, you know, it's easy for us to pick on the engineers. It's easy for us to pick on developers when things go wrong. But the truth be told, it starts with us as leaders. I sat down this year and we created a training grid. We sat down and looked at all the skills and all the technology we need to know. And then we, I, went, I went through and said, let's go through and find any one of these where I had two people that mastered it. Remember, 55 people. I had no grid that had more than one person who mastered it. Hmm. So we use, we use that as a basis for training. Communication is one of them. We're building our own Toastmasters within the performance engineering team so that we can start that process of communication. I think that a lot of a lot of time people don't communicate because they're scared. They just they don't have that skill. It's a it's a it's a learned skill. I learned it as a consultant. You know, being able to learn to sit down and talk with people takes practice. So we create the safe area for people to actually learn that skill. 
Project management's another one. Teach every engineer how to do project management. Teach every engineer how to do work planning. Teach engineers how to communicate. The things that they'll never have anybody invest time into them is what we have to do in order to elevate this practice. Otherwise, it will not elevate. It will stay where it's at. And we have too much riding on all of this just to stay stagnant. So we have to train them. That's a cost. But in the end, it's worth every bit of it. That applies to everybody, right? We, if we want something different in the industry, we have to change it. If I want something different on my team, I have to change it. I just don't think we have a choice because we're continually told how complex things are getting more and more every day with more complexity means more testing, more skills, more engineering, not less. It's not going to be removed just because somebody brings in something called AI and it's going to fix it all for us. You still have to have those foundational skill sets. So um, here's, I guess, the biggest question I have for you as we, we kind of wrap this up. I could talk to you all day. I, w I wish we could. Um, your biggest challenge for scaling this up uh, within your organization, what do you see over the next year to, you've been there about 18 months, so you kind of have a purview, but over the next year, how do, how do you continue to scale this up at the speed that you want to do? What's going to be your biggest challenge for that? So the biggest challenge is if you, if you, you guys have a, an evolutionary pyramid, the biggest challenge is people and continuing that, that upskilling the people to be able to work with the technology and continue to add value. Remember, it's effectiveness and efficiency. It's the value that we have. The, the second part is, is that we are now at the cusp where the testing practices are getting so good, the observability combination with that is getting so good, that the lowest line fruit isn't the engineers or the, the scripting or the tools or things like that. It's the test environments. I can tell you now by looking at how we test and the test results and comparing it to how the, 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 the same application performed in production that the test environments have problems. So we can create for every test that we may run for, let's like say, an API, I can end up creating three defects, one for the application, one for the test environment itself being in, inappropriately scaled or configured, and one for the underlying data set. So we are now measuring the, the effectiveness of the environments themselves. That's becoming our, our single biggest next big hurdle. The people will continue to upskill. As they upskill and as they get better, we start seeing the other chinks in the armor that would never have been noticed before. Environments, right? Well, I could, like I said, when I could sit down and I have a, a dashboard that I can sit down and show you exactly how far the environment was off and exactly what needs to be done, that's a big deal. That's going to be an existential crisis across the entire QA thought process because at this point, we're starting to create more defects against the environments than the applications. I can't validate an application if the, de if the environment isn't prepared for it. I completely agree. Completely agree. So I'm, I'm interested in maybe we should check back in about six months or a year from now and see how things have gone and, and things you might have learned that you weren't expecting uh, as you scale this up in this large enterprise. And, uh, and it's, it's always good to be able to share with others, hey, this is what we're dealing with. This is a big piece of pie that we're trying to bite off here. Um, it's, it's nice that you guys over here, you know, your $1 million a year company is great that you're doing that, but you, you've got some bigger fish to fry over here. And I think it's good for the people to see that, um, because not, not, not a lot have had that, um, that purview, I should say. So thank you again for being on the show, Matthew. You're welcome back anytime. And, uh, we'll, we'll wait to hear back on how this progress is going at Kroger soon. Excellent. I look forward to, to follow up and any opportunity that, uh, to talk as, you, as you'd like. All right. And we'll probably see you out on the road, too. Absolutely. All right. Thank you again, Matthew, for being on the show and sharing this information with us. It's rare that we actually get a company of that size to actually talk about what they do internally. And those of you who are performance engineers who may be looking for something to do, uh, sounds like they're hiring and they're going to be growing uh, over the next couple of years. So if you want to be connected to Matthew, let me know. I'll try to hook you up. Uh, but thanks again. I'd like to get your feedback on this episode. What do you think about the challenges that are faced in an organization of that size? Maybe you do work in a company that's of similar size and you face some of the same challenges. Or I'd like to know 
What are your biggest challenges for scaling performance in the enterprise? You can reach me and give me your feedback at scottmore.consulting. There is a link here to my profile on LinkedIn, as well as my load tester handle on Twitter. Uh, you can also just email me at help at scottmore.consulting. Uh, I'd like to find out what you think about this episode and other episodes that we've been putting out this year. Are we on the right track? If you like what you hear and see, please uh, subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the little bell so that you'll know about the new episodes that are coming out. Uh, they are, uh, this kind of tells me if people want to continue watching this, they're going to subscribe because they want to see more. Let's me know if I'm headed in the right direction. Would love to hear from everybody out there until the next SMC journal podcast. This is Scott Moore saying thank you for again for watching and bye-bye.